The hatch bursted open, steam and pressure emanating from the pod as it stabilized itself with the prehistoric atmosphere. Stepping straight into the crustaceous period, my colleagues and I made history. My partner Zach, an athletic Swedish man with blonde hair, blue eyes and a handlebar mustache, stepped out alongside me and took a deep breath of the ancient air. He was our trusted paleontologist and survivalist, and he shared the same passion for knowledge and love for dinosaurs like I did, and so we got along well. He only lost his temper if someone got in the way of his research, but usually was the life of the party instead. Ah, we made it boys. The age of the reptiles. I took a deep breath of fresh air as well as I took in the landscape that was in front of me. The air was so pure and the smell of vegetation was strong. I instantly got lightheaded after the first breath, and my first thought was it due to a form of jet lag from the time converter, but then quickly realized it was due to the higher oxygen percentage on the planet. Earth at this point was about 50% more oxygen than we are used to breathing. Alright guys, make sure you sit down when needed. It's gonna take a little for all of us to get used to this new environment. I looked behind me to see our young meteorologist and navigator step out from the pod as well. Her bright, curly blonde hair bouncing as she walked out of the pod. Fixing her glasses, she started going over one of her charts. Boy does she love her charts and graphs. Yeah, I might just stay in the pod and watch from the screens. Zack peered back into the pod. Lester, you better get your ass out here right now. I didn't get you cleared for time travel for you to act like a coward when the moment arrives. Besides, who can say they got to see dinosaurs in real life? Us, that's who. Now come on, let's get moving. Lester sighed. Alright, Zack, it's just I don't feel right about this. What if we don't make it back to the pot in time? Lester, my friend, we all knew these risks before going through with this. What's making you doubt yourself now? Lester looked up at Zack, his frizzy brown hair almost touching his goggle like glasses. You're the paleontologist, you tell me. It's pretty obvious. Zack surveyed the area. We were surrounded by majestic palmas and ginkgo phyta and benetatillion trees that were all as vibrant as ever. You could tell which modern plants evolved from what if you paid attention. Various shrubs and flowers were everywhere. Many of them man never had the opportunity to discover and admire. Most of them had simple evolutionary mechanics but that was expected for this era. Flowers and shrubs were just starting to flourish according to the history books, and so it wasn't a shock to see plants with cones or very simple leaves. The more Zack looked, the more he realized. There's no dinosaurs. Maybe we just landed in an underpopulated area. They probably spread out of the area just after our arrival. That machine makes a pretty loud boom for entry. Hopefully I can get this baby soundless one I designed the next model. Until then, Bessie will get the job done. Lester said while tapping the pod. It was Lester's pride and joy, his life's work. This kid spent years developing Bessie by himself in a damn basement. He was a genius, but he lacked skills in the social department, and so he didn't know how to get his work out and he came off as insane to most. I ended up finding one of his attempts to put his ideas out when I went down a random rabbit hole on the deep web. I saw his potential and I managed to persuade the government to start funding his project once I got Lester to show them how it worked. There was only a few conditions they had. Lester was now under the government's wing with full coverage and benefits. He would work at their facility and they had their own plans for his machine. Hearing this, Lester made one condition as well. He would comply as long as their said plans were for the growth of mankind and the pursuit of knowledge only, and would absolutely not contribute to the downfall of humanity by any means necessary. They agreed. In less than a month, Bessie was completed. 
They were pleased and that's where I come into the picture. I'm a physicist, a theoretical scientist. I've been working with the government for a while now and they have always supported my work. Recently, they and I have been discussing the potential of Bessie. After a lot of discussion, we decided to start out with something important but not too controversial, like trying to see the crucifixion of Jesus or something like that. Something that was significant but shrouded in mystery that could only be solved by witnessing it. And we had the perfect idea. Observe the crustaceous paleogene extinction event. My partner and I were all in the moment that we heard about it. One week later, they put Alina on the team, and Bessie was ready for use after a few test runs. At first, they thought Lester was too antisocial to go out on the field, but Zach and I managed to convince them otherwise. It was Lester's dream after all. It would have been messed up for him to do all of the work and not get to participate. After I knew everyone was present and geared up, I pulled out my tablet and I pulled out the map. We should already be in the Yucatan Peninsula, but I can't tell. The map was different than the modern one we were used to. It was strange to see the continent in different positions and angles, and pretty disorienting for someone who doesn't know better. Alina stepped up and pointed east. Still looking down at her own little tablet, she said, The Chicxulub crater was discovered this way, so I think that area over there would be the best spot for observation. She pointed over to a hill that overlooked the whole general area. It was perfect. We made our way over to the area and looked out into the vast landscape before us. It was so beautiful. It felt like true nature. Literally untouched and unchanged by man. Just beautiful forests and biomes as far as the eye can see in every direction. I could finally see some life as we could see flocks of pterodon and other types of crustaceous era birds flying around in the distance. The trees were too tall and thick to see any type of life on the ground though, but that was alright. The sky was clear and ready for observation. Strange. Zack stood there with a puzzled look staring out at the flocks. What's up, Zack? The animals are all flying in the same direction. This is unusual behavior. Predator and prey are flying together in peace. Alina tapped my shoulder and I looked over to her. She had a worried expression as she looked out at the sky and back at us. The meteor should be coming soon. If anything, they should be flying in the opposite direction. They seem to be going towards the impact zone instead. Alina pulled out her specially made telescope and started to survey the area. I noticed small beads of sweat start to form on her brow as she stared into the scope. What the? All of the animals on land are heading the same way as well. Zack, is this some sort of migration? No. This is not the kind of behavior I was expecting to see. As I was staring at the strange mass migration, I noticed another ledge that was closer to the area that looked like it would be better to set up at. Hey, Lena, is that spot over there in protection range? She looked at it and then started swiping through her tablet. Yes, actually, uh, let's go take a look at what these dinos are up to. Sounds good. Let's make it quick. As we were walking, I started to notice how simple but beautiful the flowers were in this era. I was admiring the different types of flora when I saw Alina try to pick up a petal from a big magnolia flower before Zack stopped her. Don't touch that. We are here to observe, not collect. Alina sighed. Oh, come on, seriously. Lester, can you tell him that a missing flower petal isn't that big of a deal? Zoned out on his laptop, Lester didn't even look up at the remark. Sorry, Alina, I would have to debunk the butterfly effect to prove him wrong. Just take a picture for now, until we know if taking objects back with us is even possible. Okay. Zack, I'm going to remember this if you try to pet a triceratops. Zack gave her a side glance and huffed. Trying to recover the situation, 
Alina tried to divert the attention back to the telescope. I couldn't help but notice her beautiful eyes reflected in the sunlight. Her eyes had hues of hazel, blue, and green, and each color would become dominant through what makeup she wore or the lighting of the day. I had to admit, I've started to grow fond of her throughout this past week, and that's really saying something too, as I spend most of my life on work and science instead of thinking about love or a potential family. I've just been a government man, busy all the time, always on to the next project. The only thing is, Zach and her don't get along so well. It's never bad to the point where it would be a problem, but they bickered back and forth to each other enough for the message to get across. Alina had a confused look on her face and then pointed over to Zach to take a look through the scope. When he did, his face went white and started muttering to himself, This isn't right. Zach waved me over to look and when I did, I was extremely confused. Dinosaurs of all kinds and types all going to the same area. They seemed like they were in a trance, none of them concerned with hunting or survival only the mass migration. We were able to see that they all collectively made a huge circle and stared at nothing in particular. More and more dinos just lined up like a crowd about to witness a school fight, and none of us could come up with a reason for this. We just kept on observing until we all felt a buzzing sensation in the air. It was slight, but enough to take notice. Everyone, I think this is it. I don't know what they're doing down there, but I think the meteor is finally coming. We all just watched the dinosaurs gathered up and it was just surreal. It was crazy to see an apex predator like a T-Rex stand next to their favorite snack without wanting to eat it. I was marveling at this when a beam of intense white light bursted from the skies, making the blue in the area warp away, revealing the stars and went straight into the middle of the circle the animals had created. The light disappeared and in the center of the circle stood three massive figures. The first and tallest figure, who seemed like the one in charge, was a huge man with black skin that had a green hue in the sunlight. His hair was long and wavy and it seemed metallic and perfect, without even a single strand of hair out of place. He had a long goatee with gold wrapping around it. He wore lots of gold, wearing types of jewelry that I had never seen before, and ornate robes that shone like there was electricity in the fibers somehow. The second figure was a spitting image of a biblical angel. It had a glow that emanated slightly from its center, and the most perfect facial features I had ever seen, with bright golden yellow eyes and silver hair. He had a pristine white robe and majestic white wings. There was even a halo floating over his head, and taking a good look at it, I could tell that it was some type of advanced technology rather than a divine symbol. The third figure was a green reptilian humanoid that wore nothing but a piercing orange snake eye gaze, and a pleated black metallic kilt. Even from this far, I could see the rage in the reptilian's eyes. It looked at the dinosaurs with disgust. They all had a look of disgust, but the reptilians was greater. I could tell that most of the dinosaurs in the front of the circle were blinded by the beam of light, literally seeing the instant cataract in their mindless gazes. The man in gold spoke. Ang, what is this? They should have been evolved by now. We've given these creatures over a millennia to get the intelligence we need them at, and no progress at all. Nothing but horns, scales, and feathers. The reptilian, who I assumed was Enki, put its head down in shame and uttered, This isn't how it was supposed to be. The angel looked at Enki, its voice sounding harmonious and beautiful. Your creation went down the wrong track of evolution siding with aggression more than complexity. Do we really need to let the other four know of your failure? The man in gold looked to Anki as well. These things are a disgrace to our purpose and a waste of our time and resources. They might be strong, but that's all they are. All muscle, no brain. 
The man pointed at a random spot of the circle and snapped his fingers. The moment he did this, I saw a carnage of about five Dryptoceras seemingly snap out of their trance and immediately try to attack the being. When they got close, one tried to jump up and bite his arm. The being swung his face into the dino's face, making its teeth shatter and exploding the rest of its head, sending the already airborne body flying into the distance. The other Dryptosaurus attacked anyways, not even noticing that their buddy got incinerated in less than a second. Two of them went for one leg, and one went for his back while the fourth one screeched at his face. He responded by football kicking the two that were going for his leg, making the first one explode on impact while the other split in half, and then swung his other arm back and caught the one trying to flank him without even looking and crushed it in his hand. He then looked at the one who screeched at him and let out a scream so loud that its skin ripped off and it was dead in an instant. The man in gold then snapped his fingers again, and a huge Tyrannosaurus Rex started going after him, stepping on any dinosaur in its way while roaring its classic roar. It started to pick up some speed while the figures just watched it with amused gazes. The giant man stopped the T-Rex in its tracks with one arm by grabbing its neck. He stood there for a few seconds just letting the dino try to kill him, its little arms wiggling out of reach and its jaws unable to bite him. He stared into the dino's eyes, and then slowly proceeded to pry its mouth open, and with a small grunt, he ripped its jaw from its skull and smashed it into the T-Rex, violently smashing its body into the earth, reducing it to nothing but a crumpled pile of flesh and scales. He then looked over to the spot where the T-Rex was originally, and saw its babies, two little T-Rexes that looked just like their mother. I barely had any time to think they were cute before, I watched the man in the gold stomp them out, not even snapping them out of their trance, just ruthlessly killing them. After he seemed to be pleased with himself, he started walking back to the center of the circle and snapped his fingers one last time. This time, all of the dinosaurs seemingly awoke from their trance and it turned into an instant bloodbath. Dino's necks were being bitten left and right, and bodies were being ripped apart at an increasingly faster rate. Every animal was trying to survive, and just doing what they naturally knew best. Kill, eat, stay alive, hide. Wipe, Wipe them, out. them out. I can't stand, I can't to, look stand to look at these disgusting things anymore. anymore. Yankee knelt down to one knee. If you may grant me one last chance... I will prove to you I can make a race with the intelligence we need. I just need a little bit more time. The angel spoke up instead. It seems like you already have. And with that comment, I felt my soul spit out of my body with pure terror as the angel made eye contact with me through the telescope. I wanted to run, but my fear paralyzed me. This went against science, logic, and even religion. If what the man in gold and the angel said were true, then that means that that Enki being created the dinosaurs and somehow failed. Furthermore, that angel is insinuating that the reptilian is potentially the creator of the human race as well. I wanted to say that it was impossible, but I couldn't deny what I was witnessing before my very eyes. Enki sounded confused. What do you mean? You know exactly what I mean. You will pay for your actions once we let them all play their course. You have failed again, Enki. First with a race too stupid to control, and then you make a race too intelligent to control. They need a slave race, not one that stays an animal and not one that will try to question their own creator. And worst of all, your newest creation is breaking one of the most sacred laws of divinity at the same time by leaving the course of time set upon them. The man in gold put up a hand. We will, we deal, will with deal with it when time, time corrects, corrects itself. itself. Until then, Until then. Take, two the take two of the species here and wipe the planet. Wipe the planet. Take, two take two of them as well and make our departure. Make our departure. We have much, to, we deliberate. Have much to, to deliberate. The angel put its hands together and stretched its majestic wings while its eyes started to glow golden light that spilled out of its socket. 
As this happened, I watched a few dinosaurs glow with the same light and ascend into the sky above. I was finally able to move, and I instantly dropped the telescope and I stumbled back. Without looking through the scope, I was able to see thousands of glowing dinos in the air, all flying towards the circle of lights made by the angel's eyes. I looked around to see that the rest of my teammates were stunned in either fear or awe, exactly like how I was a few seconds earlier. I reached out to put my hand on Alina's shoulder, but the buzzing got extremely intense and my hands went to my head instead. My vision was blinded for a second and when my visibility came back, I looked up to see the angel standing before us. One male, one female. You are the one intelligent enough to destroy the course of time. You will be fit. Luckily, you saved us the time to find a female counterpart. See you two in your intended course of time. The angel's eyes started to glow again, and I felt all emotion and thoughts disappear from my body and mine as I stared into his gaze. Lester and Alina started to glow and float up into the sky, and no amount of kicking or screaming would release the two from the angel's hold. The angel looked at Zack and I and smirked. I would eliminate you two right now, but it's easier if you depart your body in your course of time. Now hurry along. You don't want to keep us waiting. And with that, I watched them fly away into the mass of floating animals, and then the beam of light appeared again. While this was happening, I was forced into the pod by an unseen force with Zack. The beam of light flickered a couple of times and then it went crimson red. I felt the ground beneath me shake and I started to see everything in the vicinity get vaporized instantly. I was positive I was about to die right then, as the destruction got closer and closer, but we blinked out of there seconds before the energy wave got to Bessie. When I arrived, the complex was empty. No, no, this can't be real. I started to run around with no luck of finding a single soul. I found the remote to the monitor that was in the room, and I switched it to the news stations. The first couple of stations were just broadcasting empty desks live and I kept switching through until I found a station with actual people talking live. I felt chills flow through my spine like water as I listened to the broadcaster announce that there were mass migrations of humans in a trance-like state across the globe, all of them seemingly going to the same area. I was horrified to watch people just walk off of buildings or walk straight into the ocean without a worry at all. None of them concerned with hiding or survival, just the mass migration. I can't handle this. I'm sorry, my friend. I turned around to see Zack standing there with a 9mm pistol to his mouth. Zack, no! Blood and brain matter sprayed me as I watched my former colleague slump down into a puddle of his own blood. I stood there in stunned silence until I watched the news reporter stop talking get a distant, glazed look in her eyes and just walk off set. I couldn't believe this was happening. This doesn't make any sense at all. I don't have any time to potter about this anymore anyways. Let this post be a reminder of our mistake and a warning to whoever gets to read this, if anyone reads this at all. Never mess with things you don't understand, and some things should just stay a mystery. I gotta go. I can hear the buzzing.